Good evening, and welcome to the happenings in Medfield. You know, today and this evening sitting here brings back a lot of beautiful memories. We all know Richard de Sorga, teacher, town historian, and now selectman. But we're going to go one step further. Richard has put together a book, This Old Town, Remembering Medfield. Richard and I have worked together uh, many times, and this is one occasion I'm looking forward to. And so without further ado, it's always my pleasure to welcome Richard de Sorga and this old town. Richard? Jack, thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, you want to fill us in on this book and what is happening? Well, it's, um, it's called This Old Town, as you said, Remembering Medfield. And what it is, is a collection for the past, actually it's been 10 years this year, um, that I've written the weekly um, articles on Medfield history. Uh, for the past 10 years with Hometown Weekly, and for about uh, six years, I also wrote for Patch, Medfield Patch. And what I would do is come up with different stories of interest from Medfield's history in our very, very beginning, right up to events happening uh, today. And I've had a lot of different people say, uh, well, why don't you put them together in the form of a book? And I had uh, our town moderator, Scott McDermott, uh, give me a call, and uh, he was connected with uh, doing some legal work with uh, uh, one of the publishing companies, and he said, you know, let, let me get you in touch with the publishing company. You really should, you know, put some of your work together into a book form. And so I followed through with that, and uh, this is what we've come up with. And because of the size, uh, I selected 74 uh, stories. Um, that I thought were, you know, interesting stories that um, have been in the, uh, the articles I've written over the past 10 years. And uh, we got them together. And um, I want to really thank the Medfield Historical Society uh, for the uh, photos. Um, uh, they gave me access uh, to the photos, and, uh, which I like in the book. Uh, I just love some of the old photos. Uh, <clears throat> the one on the cover is... Uh, one of my favorite because it shows Medfield uh, exactly 100 years ago in uh, 1913. And you can see the old town hall uh, before the 1923 fire. But you can see the trolley uh, out in front. And one of the articles I did was on the trolleys. The trolley was here in Medfield from um, 1899 to 1924. And you can see the trolley uh, uh, in Medfield Center. Um, a couple of the buildings are now gone. Uh, what was um, Fitz's old corner store, but you can see Monk's Block in the, in the background, and that's where um, um, Royal Pizza and um, um, Go Fresh are located today. So um, the, the photos I love uh, as well, in particular. So I tried to select stories that give you kind of a capsule look at Medfield's history. I have some stories about the founding of Medfield, uh, I have some on the, uh, the Native American attack. Uh, I have some on our veterans and the role the veterans have played from the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, right up until uh, the war in Iraq. Uh, <clears throat> great story on uh, Stephen Reichardt uh, and uh, the, um, the, the story he went through and the resulting medal that uh, he achieved. I'll talk about that uh, momentarily. And then even things right up to today to things like uh, Friendlies and Lords and uh, the old Super Duper. And, um, and then uh, there's a lot of other stories with people in Medfield. I, I think the thing that, one of the things that makes Medfield so special are, are the people that are here in town. Um, people in our past and people that are here right now. And I try to include uh, you know, some of the different stories of people that have really made a difference in Medfield. Um, so it's kind of a capsule history. And um, we just had our first uh, kind of book signing uh, at uh, Park Street Books uh, last Saturday. And 
Uh, next Saturday, which would be the Saturday before Thanksgiving, uh, the Historical Society has their annual uh, Peak House Pantry sale, and I'm going to uh, set up a uh, shop there as well, and, and uh, I'll do some book signing there um, uh, as well. So um, hopefully people enjoy it. Uh, it's a little look at, uh, uh, at Medfield and uh, what's special about it. You know, Richard, I recall, well, it's been, no, oh, I don't know, two, two and a half, three years ago, you and I sat at this anchor desk, and we did it in sequence. Right. The beginning of Medfield all the way up to World War, a point, II. World right. War II. And that was done in 12 series. Well, we, those are all gone. They're sold, and <laughs> everybody wanted them. You know, it's surprising in my wandering around Medfield, as I do in the mornings early, how many comments people have relative to Medfield. This is a close town, not sparsely populated, but enough that people are interested in their town. Now, the Hometown Weekly, I have turned through it, this old town. And I'm quite sure that our viewers, getting the Hometown Weekly, have read your articles. And now they're in book form. Some of the areas that you've covered are excellent. It brings back a lot of memories to an awful lot of people. Yeah. Because I can state and I've heard, gee, I remember when. Right. Or I remember one in particular that I will never forget is the one that we had done when they uh, destroyed that lovely home with a tank. <laughs> the Manor Inn. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so some of the areas that people remember. So I wonder if you can carry on and sure. give us more information. Sure. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit. Uh, I don't have time to go through all 74, but I'll... I'll uh, I'll talk a little bit. Uh, first of all, I, I, it was special for me that I, I dedicated this uh, book to a, uh, uh, the best friend I had, I grew up with. I knew him since I was uh, five years old. Lived on uh, Summer Street where I lived and uh, went through school, graduated out of Midfield High School with him, graduated out of UMass Amherst. Uh, we stayed uh, uh, best friends uh, and he tragically died uh, of a heart attack. Uh, uh, while working as uh, one of the baseball coaches uh, for Tufts. And so the dedication I have is to Kevin Burr. Uh, there's a nice picture of him, and, uh, and there's a, kind of an article I wrote uh, that dealt with, uh, we're still a small town, and, and about his funeral and how word spread. I think in a small town, um, the fastest communications, I think, is when somebody dies and, and word spreads and, and people get a hold of other people. Um, so uh, I was real uh, honored to uh, dedicate this to uh, to Kevin. Uh, his family is still uh, his uh, his dad uh, still lives here in Medfield, and uh, his uh, uncle and aunts and uh, cousins uh, are still here in Medfield. His his wife Wendy's over in uh, in Medway. She teaches here at uh, at Medfield High School as well. So uh, that that was real special for me to to put that in memory of Kevin. Um, and I, I tried to, as I said, uh, give you a whole capsule look at Medfield, selecting stories from the founding of Medfield right up to present day. So some of that, uh, the first chapter deals with, and actually uh, I, I just want to uh, commend uh, Claire Shaw, who lives here in Medfield. She was a member of the, one of the curators at the Historical Society, and she did uh, the bulk of my proofreading. She just has an incredible eye uh, and made a number of uh, suggestions and corrections for me. So um, the, 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 the layout and the proofreading, uh, she did just a great job on. But she suggested that since a lot of the stories uh, deal with early Medfield, that I should have a special section that told about who were these first 13 settlers. And so the book opens up with kind of a capsule look uh, at the first 13 settlers in Medfield. Um, a couple of them I'm sure um, you've heard of. Um, probably the most famous is Ralph Wheelock. Um, Ralph Wheelock um, is called the founder of Medfield, 
But he also has a, a special history uh, that ties into the reason that the elementary school here in Midfield is named after him. Um, he was one of the very few, and, and very few people were really educated um, to the degree we think today back then, but Ralph Wheelock was, um, and he had graduated from Cambridge College in England and was one of the few people that was given the special title of Mr. We called him Mr. Uh, Mr. Wheelock. And he uh, was the first teacher of the first public school um, that actually was paid for through taxes, and that was over in Dedham. And then from Dedham, he and 13 others came here, to, or 12 others came here to Medfield, and he became the first school teacher here in Medfield as well. Mm -hmm. He was on the first board of selectmen. He was one of our first representatives. And there's just a, a great, uh, great little story of politics uh, with, uh, with Ralph Willock. He was also given the first lot. And the first 13 settlers were given usually um, either six or 12 acre plots. And their homes generally were on Main Street. And they were usually on the, um, the north side of Main Street facing south. And then their fields were opposite. Well, Ralph Wheelock uh, was given the lot right where, uh, right in the intersection of Main and North Street, where Monk's Block is today. And that's where like Royal Pizza is in that mm -hmm. area. Um, um, and his field went across the street. Well, on all these early New England towns, basically they would lay a town out uh, almost like a cross. So you had a north-south road would cross with an east-west road and where the two cross became the center of town. Well, we have our main street is the north-south road in Medfield, and then we have North Street and South Street. Well, South Street used to be where Pleasant Street, so we used to have that perfect cross. Well, that was also in the field of Ralph Wheelock, and he wanted nothing to do with the street in the middle of his field. He was losing acreage, and so he went to the selectmen, one of which was himself, and they voted to actually move South Street, and they moved South Street down to where it is today. And that's why we have that little dog leg from North Street down to where Lords used to be, where Roach Brothers is coming in. Because um, South Street used to run directly opposite North Street, where Pleasant Street is. Now, Pleasant Street came in many years later. But there's a little early politics that Ralph Wheelock actually had the street moved, moved. so that it wouldn't be in his property. But uh, there's some information on Ralph Wheelock. And people say, well, why is the elementary school named you know, the Ralph Wheelock School? He's one of the very special people uh, here in Medfield. The other name of our 13th settlers you might recognize is Timothy Dwight. The Dwight Derby House yeah. uh, is named after him. That's where he lived. Uh, he was one of the first 13th settlers. And so you can see just the age of the Dwight Derby House is going back to one of our first 13th settlers. Um, then I get into um, the beginnings of Medfield. Uh, the book opens up chapter one, in the beginning. And I think I make this statement, we forget sometimes just how old Medfield is. You know, we're the 43rd oldest town here in what was then Massachusetts Bay Colony. And as you know, Massachusetts is one of the oldest states. Uh, oh, and so, you know, we're, we're one of the oldest towns. And what is now Millis and Medway all used to be part of Medfield. So Medfield was actually on both sides of the Charles River. And it's interesting, this year Medway is celebrating their 300th anniversary. Uh, 1917, because that's when they broke away from Medfield. And, and then, of course, Millis in 1881 broke away from Medway. So both Millis and Medway uh, used to be part of Medfield. And I tell a little bit, uh, when the town was first founded, um, <clears throat> the first thing you would have uh, in a town would be the grist mill to be built. People say, well, you know, why a grist mill? What? And many people say, what, what is a grist mill? But it's the idea that Corn was the main uh, crop in this area. And you needed to be able to grind the hard kernels of corn, grind that down so that you could get your flour, so you could do your baking, you could make your, your breads and your, your uh, meal and, and everything out of, out of the corn. So um, an economic necessity of these small towns would have been the grist mill. And that's why later on, which is one of the chapters dealing when Medfield gets attacked in the, uh, during the King Philip War, one of the first places the Native Americans burnt here in Medfield and the other towns would be the grist mill. So we got our grist mill uh, that's built. Then usually the cemetery, they called it the burying grounds, would have been laid out. 
you would have had that. Then you would have had the Meeting House, and where our, uh, the First Parish uh, Unitarian Universalist Church is on North Street today is the site uh, of the original Meeting House. And the uh, church that's there today is the third building uh, on that site. Uh, and then you would have had the school. And in 1666, uh, where Zebras is today on North Street, we have our first school built. And here in New England, uh, in Medfield, education was very important. And uh, by law, you had to have a school, uh, over 50 households, you had to have a school in over 100 households, you had to have a school that would teach people to go to the college. And that college, of course, was, was Harvard. Um, so education is important. So um, that's a little bit of the layout. And as I begin to look at, at Medfield, I talk about the early years. And before, and the Native Americans, of course, had been here um, uh, for um, hundreds of years before um, the first you know, English arrived. Uh, and what they used to do is they used to burn all of Medfield. They would have fires to burn the, uh, the forest and the, and the brushes because what was good here was the berry bushes, the blueberries and others that were here. And so when these first settlers, these first 13 settlers came to Medfield, there was wide open plains that were here. You know, there's mm -hmm. more trees today in Medfield now than there were back then. It was oh, just darn. wide open. Mm -hmm. the, the reports of the early settlers had said you could look in the far distance and actually see where the deer were. It was just wide open uh, plains that were here. And the first settlers that actually came here before the first 13, there were uh, farmers from Dedham that came out here with their cows, and they would um, let them graze out here. And you had herdsmen that were here, and they built these small shelters called herd houses. And those were the first structures in Medfield with these herd houses. And then when the first 13 settlers came, they began to build houses that would have resembled what we see in the Peak House uh, today. So it's a very wide open plains. And I, I tell uh, the story that uh, when the first settlers came in, they came in what is now our Foundry Street. And then they worked their way around uh, the second highest elevation in Medfield, uh, and that is Mount Nebo. And they actually paused on the top of Mount Nebo, and they looked over this vast plain. You could see the, the Charles River um, meadows and the river in the distance. Uh, and they really looked, I mean, they, these are very religious people, they're Puritans, and they looked at this as their promised land. And that's why they named that hill Mount Nebo, the, the other Mount Nebo is in the Holy Land, and that, from the Bible, is where Moses uh, looked out of what he said was his promised land on no. Mount Nebo. And that's why our Mount Nebo uh, was named that, because that's where these first settlers uh, uh, came to give thanks. You know, they went there. And what I, I try to tie in, not only did they give thanks, but I kind of talk about the book, uh, and uh, talk about the article which I wrote, I think at the time in 2008, about people in Medfield that we really still are thankful for today. And I, I talked about Ian Thompson, who was the selectman at the time, and, and, and all the work, uh, the civic work that, that she did. And I talk about Beth Eby, who did the, um, and still works, with the Medfield Food Cupboard. And all the time, and all the, the good we, ha uh, we, we have, um, from Beth and the thanks, we really owe her. And then people I talk about here like Bill Kingsbury, uh, our fire chief, uh, who works with the Medfield Home Committee. Bill does so many things behind the scenes. Nobody knows he does that. Uh, he's a quiet guy, he seeks no publicity at all, but he's there working. And I, I talk about him and, and uh, Bill Pope uh, with Zulo Gallery um, and the efforts uh, that he does um, uh, and um, the, I talk about the Garden Club and, and all the work they do around town to beautify the squares and, um, and, and the people. Uh, I, I specifically talked about uh, um, Dorothy uh, Atwood, um, who lives on Main Street in the uh, 1860 house, the Metcalf Smith house that she restored. And the people in Medfield that restore a lot of their historic homes that give us that, that kind of special piece of history that we still see in Medfield. So I, I tried to go from the Puritans giving thanks to arriving Medfield to today, the people we still have uh, to give thanks. Um, 
just skipping through here, <coughs> Reverend Wilson, who was the first minister here in Medfield, uh, is a great story with him. Uh, he was in the very first class of Harvard College. Hmm. There were only eight that graduated, and he was one of those eight. Uh, and, and, and he was here during the, the attack on Medfield. And I, I try to picture what a job he must have had. Um, you know, half the town was burnt uh, in that attack. Uh, Seventeen of our uh, residents uh, and some of the soldiers that had been sent here to help were killed. And afterwards, how do you care for these people that have lost loved ones, all their belongings, their homes? What a job uh, he must have had, you know, as, as our minister. Well, certainly, I think so. Um, so I talk about him. I, there's a whole chapter on... Uh, on the Native American attack uh, on Medfield and just some of the stories of uh, the horror stories of, uh, of, um, uh, of what happened to, to people uh, uh, and how they tried to race and get to the garrisons and uh, a number were scalped and killed and infants and then and, and, uh, there was the 99 year old Jonathan Fussell who uh, his daughter and son-in-law made that must have been a horrible decision that can we carry this you know, men with us and try to get to the garrison, but that would slow us down. And they made the decision that they had to leave him behind. He was burnt alive in his home. And there's just some amazing stories uh, with, uh, with the Indian attack on Medfield. Um, a great uh, story, my chapter six is called The Medfield Irish, Happy St. Patrick's Day. And probably the largest um, ethnic group here in Medfield uh, are the Italians and the Irish. And in particular, uh, with the Irish, um, um, you know, when they first came to Medfield, um, because of the potato famine, they came into Boston. And then you have this trickle effect that comes from Boston out to Medfield. And some of the first came here to Medfield, they were called green girls uh, by the locals. And many of them worked as maids on, on, on some of the Medfield homes here. <clears throat> and then eventually, you have more and more of the Irish come out, but they faced, uh, as did the Italians, some real prejudice, you know, here in Medfield. Uh, there's a, a great uh, story, I mentioned uh, part of it here, that the big industry in Medfield in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, was the hat factory and the making of hats. In fact, the Medfield hat factory was the second largest felt and straw hat factory in the country. We had more people working at the Medfield hat factory upwards of 13, 1400 than the population of the town. And many of the workers came from uh, the provinces in Canada, uh, and they came from Maine, and they came down here to work. And there's a story that there was actually um, posted on the, on the door of the hat factory in the late 1800s saying, uh, no Irish need apply. So we hear oh. a lot, we hear about this in Boston, but here it is, you know, right here in Midfield. Yeah. Um, and then you have the, one of my favorite characters, uh, this Edwin Mitchell, known as Colonel Mitchell. And I think when we had our series, we, we talked a lot oh, about the Colonel. Oh, you bet we did. We talked <laughs> yeah. about the Colonel. But what's interesting, the Colonel takes down those signs. And I think he realizes with his hat factory, he's going to need the Irish to work in these hat factories. And that's also one of the reasons St. Edward's uh, gets built in Medfield uh, in the 1890s, because he actually owned the lands. And, and the prejudice was there was an unwritten rule in Medfield. You did not sell land or property uh, to the Irish in Medfield to try to keep them out. And every time that an Irish, is able, an Irish person is able to buy land, it's always through what they call a straw. And someone would buy that and then, because they made arrangements. And then within a few weeks, they would turn around and then sell it to someone who was Irish. And that's how St. Edward's Church came in. Mitchell mm. buys the property, and then he turns around, he sells it to the Archdiocese of Boston, and we have a, a Catholic church that comes in that a lot of the Irish that are coming here, working in the hat factory now, have a, have a church as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's interesting, um, in fact, that the Irish could not be buried in our Vine Lake Cemetery. It's not until the 1890s, and we actually have a town meeting article to allow a section of the cemetery to be set aside for the burying of, of Catholics uh, in Medfield. Uh, and that passes town meeting, despite the fact that the uh, committee to make the recommendation voted two to one against it. 
Um, and then, of course, I, I talk about after World War II, the floodgates come in. Then we have the, uh, the GI Bill, and uh, you have this whole urban uh, going across the country, moving from urban out to suburban. And that's when you get the first developments that come here in Medfield. I have a great little story about the, the first development that comes to Medfield, which comes in right after World War II. And that's the area of Summer Street, Lowell Mason Road. And that area becomes the first um, you know, real development in Medfield. <clears throat> and then I, I, I donated several chapters uh, to our veterans. I, I just have um, just the highest regard and, and, and every chance I can to try to uh, honor and, and, as you always say, at least we forget to make sure that we don't forget. So I have several chapters dealing with our veterans. Uh, there's a great one here, chapter eight, it's called Medfield and the Date That Will Live in Infamy, uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor. And we have mm -hmm. a local Medfield a boy who actually was born and brought up in Saugus, and then his mother moved here during the Depression. She had no work. She had a young family. And she has a friend in Medfield that gets her job in the hat factory. And she moves to 6 Green Street. Uh, but even with her young family, um, she is not making enough. The father had died to feed the family. And uh, that's the Pace family. And uh, Joe, Joseph Pace, I think this is uh, in, uh, in the late 1930s, realizing that his mother can't afford to feed everyone in the family, he enlists into the, into the Navy. And uh, he eventually is sent out to um, San Diego. And then, of course, as things begin to heat up between the Americans and the Japanese, Roosevelt makes the decision to move our main fleet out of San Diego out to this base probably no one ever heard about before called Pearl Harbor mm -hmm. in Hawaii. And so he's out there on December 7th, uh, that early Sunday morning when the alarm goes off. He was worked with the radio, um, and he was on what was called the antenna repair uh, crew. And all of a sudden, the uh, Pearl Harbor is under attack. And now uh, he's racing, trying to get ammunition. The US, he was on the USS Pennsylvania, which actually was in dry dock. Yep. And he's racing up and down, uh, trying to bring ammunition. And one of the Japanese bombs, uh, Actually, three of them fell on the, on the Pennsylvania, one right where he was, instantly killing. There were six of them on that, um, it was called the antenna uh, repair crew. Five of them are instantly killed. Another one who I got to interview uh, was just totally burnt. He said it was like a firestorm. And they were only in like cutoffs and t-shirts. They were just getting up, you know. They, they didn't even know what was happening. So he's killed. and. Um, and then it, eventually uh, the, the body is brought back here and the, med, the Beckwith Post 110 American Legion along with the Saugus uh, American Legion um, have a ceremony and he's buried uh, you know, in the cemetery in Saugus. So there's a great picture of him uh, that we have here. Um, and then um, I, I talk about some of our veterans from um, the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. One was uh, David Meany. Now, and I have a whole chapter on the Meany family, and that's Bob Meany, who is our police chief's family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And his, um, would it be grandfather, great-grandfather, uh, comes over here from Ireland uh, just before the Civil War. And like a lot of the Irish, they just arrived in this country, and all of a sudden, they're in fighting, you know, for their new country, um, uh, having just arrived here. And there's three different spellings of his name. It, his M-A, anyway, Meany. Meany and then Meany. So he has three different spellings depending upon the time period. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's involved in many of the major battles uh, of the Civil War. And in two of them, he's with fellow Medfield uh, uh, residents. And two of them are killed right by him. So he sees two of his Medfield buddies uh, killed, once fighting with Grant in Tennessee, and once he's with General Sherman uh, marching after they went through Georgia, they started no. coming up into North Carolina. Um, and eventually, uh, he's honorably discharged at the end of the war. He stays in for the whole war. And then, ironically, he comes back here to Medfield. And you know what he, his uh, job is here in Medfield? <clears throat> he becomes the town constable. I'll be darned. <clears throat> Which, of course, now Bob Meany is the police chief. Uh -huh. So I think he has that police genes uh, in him. So it's just a great story uh, of the veterans, and that kind of tied into the Meany family. But I also wanted to mention uh, Steve Reichart. Uh, uh, who's a graduate of Medfield High School <clears throat> um, 
back in, uh, uh, I think he's 2000, uh, no, he's 1998. Steve was 1998. He grew up on Green Street, and <clears throat> he was in, uh, in the Marines, and he's up on this water tower uh, in this small town in Iraq, and the, the American troops are coming through um, to protect. There's a, a religious ceremony going on, and, and they're kind to, uh, and so he's up watching. And he sees in the distance um, a terrorist. And in fact, they were a mile away. Um, and he actually uh, opens up fire from a mile away. Uh, the terrorists open up fire on the American troops. And he actually kills one of, the, one of the terrorists. And fighting breaks out. Well, the American troops that are down below, they don't realize that he's up there. And so they think they're getting shot at at different, at different angles. And they actually begin also firing up on him as well. So he's by, by friendly fire, because they don't know. They're, his shot's coming yeah, down. He's so. shooting. Um, and so he's actually getting shot at twice by his own troops and also by the, by the terrorists. And he, he and this uh, other buddy of his stayed up there, uh, continuing to uh, shoot at the terrorists to protect the Americans and the others that were in this religious uh, retreat that were down there. Uh, and eventually, <clears throat> word gets out, and he's able to be rescued. But let me just read. There's a... <clears throat> little um, snippet here. It said, uh, Marine Sergeant uh, Stephen Reichart uh, received the bronze medal, star, bronze star medal for valor. It said, Steve uh, and his spot crawled atop an abandoned oil storage tank in Iraq. The mission was routine as they covered their squad's patrol movement through this small town. But what happened became a mission that went down in the annals of Marine Corps history. Um, so there's a great story on, uh, on Stephen uh, there as well. Stephen uh, lives down, uh, I think he's down in uh, the Carolina area uh, mm -hmm. today. Um, and then I go into things like the Zulo Gallery and its history uh, that used to be the, uh, actually the Zulo Gallery used to be located across from where our post office is. And in 1860, they moved that whole building uh, over to where it is today on Main Street. And then eventually after the Civil War, was called the Grand Army of the Republic. Mm -hmm. It was like the, it was like the American Legion for the Civil War uh, veterans before the American Legion comes in. And they used that as their headquarters. And now, uh, thanks to Bill Pope and many others, uh, with the Art Council and others, we have what a gem of, a, of an art studio um, here in a little town like Medfield. Uh, the art that's put on display there. And, and they've done such a great job on the first Thursdays they have uh, music up there. You can go up and get a, a hamburger or a glass of beer or a glass of wine during the summer. You can overlook. You can view the art that's there. Uh, just what a gem of a, of a building. So I got a lot on, uh, on the Zulo Gallery. Um, I, you got to stop me, Jack, I, with the time here, but I can just go on here. Um, the Arcadians. There's a, there's a great story. Um, during the French and, and uh, Indian Wars, of course, France controlled all what is now Canada. And in that fighting, eventually, um, we take over uh, places like Nova Scotia, Halifax, or the English. Um, and what we did was horrible, we meaning the English. Um, <clears throat> we forced, we have a forced deportation of French citizens that lived up in places like New Brunswick and, and Nova Scotia. And they were sent all over America. Many went down to uh, what is now New Orleans, where you have the, the strong French you know, community that's down there today. But we had about a dozen sent here to Medfield. And they were jammed into ships. Uh, they were poverty-stricken. And they come here to Medfield, and there are many assigned to homes that work on with the, you know, the farms and the people here. Uh, Medfield Town Meeting brings up to build a poorhouse to house these um, Arcadians, as they became known as. And the town meeting defeats it rather than build it. So, I mean, these people lived in just horrible poverty here in Midfield for many, many years until the French and Indian War uh, ends in, uh, in um, 1763. And then, to Midfield's credit, uh, our town does raise funds to get them um, on a boat to pay for their trip back to their home that they were deported on. But it was interesting, in the town of Walpole, they refused to pay for that. And these people, these, these French Canadians, walked 
from Walpole back to New Brunswick and Nova Scotia through, through the wilds. Of that, and we're talking, uh, you know, the 18th century, the wilds of New Hampshire and Maine, and they made their way back. So there's a great story on the, uh, on the Arcadians uh, that are in there. Um, I just mentioned uh, great pictures, uh, our town hall. Uh, I tell the story burnt twice. Um, two years uh, after it was built uh, in, uh, in 1874, and then again in, in um, 1923. And this is kind of a funny story because at the time, the town hall had not only uh, our government uh, business, but it also had the post office, the police station, the fire station, uh, all the highway um, equipment was all in our town hall. Uh, and so when uh, our fire station was down underneath in the back of the town hall. So when the alarm came in, the, the person down picked up the phone and said, well, where's the fire? And the person said, over your head, <laughs> because the town hall was burning, you know, right above them. So we got some stories on uh, town hall, um, some of our town buildings. There's a great story I always like to tell around Halloween, and that's the first murder uh, here in Medfield. Uh, which happened in 1802, and if we hadn't had it documented, you would think we were making the story up, because it happens just before uh, Halloween. And on that, uh, two characters, there's uh, Ebenezer Mason, and they, the Masons lived up the very end of Pine Street. And the father was getting on in years, and he couldn't run the farm anymore, and usually the farm would be passed to the next oldest son, the oldest son. Well, the oldest son was Ebenezer, who had some issues with uh, uh, just this mental illness and other things. He, he had some real serious issues, and the father didn't feel he could turn the farm over to him. So instead, he bypassed Ebenezer, and he gave it to his son-in-law, this guy by the name of William Pitt Allen. Well, this, of course, enrages Ebenezer. And when William is out working in the, in the field, he comes behind him with the shovel, smashes him over the head, murders him, kills him there, and takes off. Well, eventually they catch him, they put him on trial over in Dedham. He's found guilty, uh, and they execute him. They execute him. And they bury the body in the family plot in our Vine Lake Cemetery. Now, here's where it gets kind of spooky. Uh, on Halloween, um, two people go in and steal the body, body snatchers. And what they do is they take the body. Well, the next day, um, the selectmen, everybody see that the body has been stolen. And there's this outrage and horror in Medfield. And the selectmen formed this vigilante group to go out and find the body and find who had murdered or who had stolen the body of, of William Pitt Allen. Well, we actually have a, an eyewitness that comes forward, and they identify two people, one guy from Franklin, one guy from Dedham. They actually catch the people, they get the body, and with this eyewitness, now they're going to bring the, the two people to, to court for, for body snatching. So the day before the trial, the, the eyewitness disappears, never to be found again. So now they, they have no eyewitness, they have to let the guy go. Now the selectmen, this is where it gets bizarre, the selectmen are afraid to rebury the body back in the Mason plot, that it will be stolen again. So what they do is they dismember the body. Now, I'm a member of the Board of Selectmen. I can't imagine this taking place. <laughs> um, but uh, they cut the head off, and they bury the head down, it said, by, in the field by Stop River. They take the main part of the body. Now, this is early 1800s that they believed the soul was in. And they buried it, they said, at the intersection of South Street and Noon Hill Road because it would be at a crossroad so the soul would decide between heaven and hell which road to take. Then it said the remaining parts of the body they buried in undisclosed locations around town. Now, this is the most bizarre story. And the oh, fact oh, that oh. It, it, the body snatching takes place on Halloween you know, makes just for a great <laughs> story. So I included that story. That's one of my favorite stories. Um, that are in there. Um, again, you got to stop me, Jack, on time here, but uh, I talk, um, there's a chapter here called Lazy Days of Summer. Uh, back in the 1800s, the Charles River um, off the of Causeway Street, this guy by the name of uh, Joseph Clark decided that he was going to pitch a tent out in that area near the Charles River and stay there for the summer because it would be a great spot. 
Well, he did, and then soon relatives and friends and other people began to not only pitch tents, but then build small cottages. And it was on Midfield and, and the other side, on the Miller side, of what is, is, is still is Dwight Street, although the Midfield part uh, no longer is accessible, but the Miller section is. Um, and eventually you had um, a, a number of people that summered, that lived in Medfield proper, but then summered along the Charles River, and they had a diving board off of the bridge that went over the Charles River on Dwight Street. Uh, they built a music hall uh, that, interesting, is now what we know as the Charles Cafe on Route 109. Uh, the restaurant place in Millis was the old music hall from there. And they had, you know, it said the ice man and the, and the, and the butcher and stuff would make the rounds. And people would stay there from June, July, August. Uh, into September, if the weather was good, and it said the kids would actually walk there from school. Um, then uh, I, I tell about Kingsbury's Pond. That becomes, uh, in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, that becomes kind of the swimming hole for Medfield. We had a beach there. They put sand down. There was a raft out there. They had a lifeguard that was there. And then I go into the swimming facility today, which is Hinkley Pond. Uh, which uh, was opened in 1962, named after Stephen Hinckley, one of the two Medfield kids that were killed in the, in the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. So there's some interesting stories of just Medfield in the summer. And I have to mention uh, one of my favorite people in Medfield, uh, Red Palumbo. Uh, and he started the whole uh, Little League program back in 1952 yeah, here in Medfield. Yeah. And <clears throat> there's a great story because it's still there, Paul Seely. The, remember the Sealy family is still here in Midfield today. Um, he was a welder, and um, uh, Red's brother Bill uh, found out that uh, where Harvard Stadium is today um, used to be totally encircled. Uh, right now, the two end zones are open. Well, they were taking out the bleachers that used to be in Harvard Stadium, and we got word of that, and we went and asked if we Medfield could take that and use it for our new Little League field as our bleachers. And they said, yeah, Paul Seeley went down, cut them out. We actually took that whole section of bleachers that are there today in the Little League field on, on Metacomet Park. So those, those bleachers actually were part of the stands at, uh, at the Coliseum, the Harvard uh, Stadium, football stadium. Um, but he started, Red Plumbo started that uh, whole Little League program. And, uh, many people in town, I mention a lot of them here, went out every night after work and they raked all the rocks out of that. Everything was hand done back then. And they started the Little League program. I think there were four teams in 1952 they started and they raised money for uniforms. And uh, that started the whole uh, Little League program that is such a big part of midfield today. And then uh, I, I talk a lot about school sports. Uh, and I just want to mention a little... Uh, um, with the schools. Um, I have two different chapters, the early schools, and where Zebras is today was the site of the first schoolhouse. And then uh, Medfield was divided into school districts, so we had a north district, which had a north school, and a south district, which had a south school, because you walked. You walked to school back then. And I tell some stories on that, and then we get into the schools we have today, and why they're named uh, the way they are, and, and how those schools came about. Um, and I, a couple of things I talk about um, was the football, um, which early on was, was the sport. Uh, today, I think we have so many different sports. Uh, but back in the early days, football was one of your few sports. And football is one of the oldest sports in midfield. It starts back in 1897. And I tell about the time in the early 1900s, Medfield um, high school football team lost to Millis 108 to nothing. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know. Um, and we actually disbanded football for a while, a while after that. And then in the 30s and 40s, there were so few kids in midfield. I mean, the graduating classes were, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17, um, that we had to go to a six-man football league. Uh, so there was, uh, because we didn't have <laughs> 12 players, uh, you know, to, 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 have, a, um, uh, to have a team. Um, and I tell about the, probably one of the, the, the most uh, famous uh, football games was the Thanksgiving game in 1953 when Midfield beat Westwood. We used to play Westwood on Thanksgiving then, 7-6. to six. And after the game, 
The fans tore down the goalposts. They had this huge caravan back to midfield. Um, just the excitement and stuff uh, that went on. So there's a lot of that. There's several chapters dealing with sports here in midfield. In the 1970s, uh, it was basketball at midfield high school. It was called Big Blue. Uh, and it, it was a happening. It wasn't just a sport. Um, again, uh, I, I go into um, some of the people here in Medfield that have played such a, a major role. Uh, people like Phil Burr, people like uh, Marshall Chick, uh, people like uh, Tom Blake. Uh, I have a chapter here, actually on my dad, I was proud to write, called Midfield's Mr. Hockey. My dad was, no. uh, in fact, it would be 50 years Next year, in 1964, he started the first of the youth hockey and high school hockey. Uh, and there's a lot of great pictures and stories of, of the hockey program. Uh, people like uh, Bob Hersey, who is a, uh, an icon of a music teacher that was here from Midfield from, the, I think, 1957 uh, uh, up until uh, uh, the 1990s. Uh, just so many different stories. Bill Reagan, who started uh, Lojack, uh, as a way to save police officer lives. Uh, he was a selectman here in Midfields when, as well. Um, we story about the tramps and gypsies that were here in Midfield. And then stories like Lords and the impact that Lords, Lords yeah. you know, had and, and the state hospital. That's uh, important. And that, of course, is a huge issue today of what is going to happen uh, up in Midfield State Hospital. Yeah. Should the town buy it? Should we leave it to the state? And if we do buy it, what should go up there? So, um, you know, let me know, Jack. Uh, what, what well, what I, what I wanted to say, Richard, as you've gone through many, many of the stories, I find they are extremely interesting. Not only to me as I'm sitting here listening to you, but I know from readers. For what you have done is the stories behind the stories. How a town began up to the present. I know there's an awful lot of work involved relative to what you have done. And I recommend to many of our viewers, make it a point to purchase this book. For not only is it the stories behind the stories, but it's stories of interest of Medfield that you are a part of. Richard, before we close, and I really don't want to, <laughs> uh, is there anything you'd like to add regarding your book, This Old Town, and other specific areas of what you have accomplished. Sure. Uh, if, uh, if people are interested to get it, uh, it's for sale all the time at Park Street Books. Uh, as I said, I'm not sure when this broadcast will come out, but on the uh, Saturday before Thanksgiving, uh, I'll have another uh, book signing uh, during the Historical Society Peak House Pantry Sale. Uh, people can also get it uh, through me uh, if they... Um, want to send a note, uh, I'm on 13 Lawrence Circle here in Midfield. The cost of the book is $12.95 plus tax. It comes out to $13.77. If it's here in Midfield, I'll actually deliver it to your house for free. Uh, if it, it needs to be shipped anywhere, uh, there is a $2.98 uh, shipping cost, so that takes it up to $16.75 to be shipped. If you'd like it signed, I'd be more than happy to. Uh, attach a note uh, who it's to. Uh, so they can get it through through me at 13 Lawrence Circle here in Midfield. They can also buy it down at uh, Park Street Books. It's, you can also get it online at Amazon. It's on uh, Amazon.com. Uh, um, the good thing about this, it was all done through self-publishing, which, uh, which puts it on uh, Amazon, so they can, they can also get it there as well. Um, no, I, I just had a fun time uh, writing the stories as I do each week and kind of selecting, you know, which stories that to put in. I've always had kind of a fascination with weather. And so I have a number of chapters about the, the great floods here in Medfield, 
uh, the hurricanes. I have a great story on the hurricane of 1938, and my all-time favorite was the blizzard of 78, uh, and went on uh, with that. And uh, places that are gone now, like uh, Rocky Woods, that uh, Rocky Woods is here as a great open space area, but back uh, in, the, in the late 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, uh, it was one of the best recreational areas uh, in the whole state, especially with the skating and stuff. And some great photos and pictures about uh, Rocky Woods and some of those other things. So um, I had fun uh, putting it together, and a lot of people had helped me with that and encouraged me, and uh, hopefully people do get it, they'll enjoy it. I'm sure they will. Uh, now, the address again, your home address is? 13 Lawrence Circle here in Medfield, and it's $13.77. Uh, that includes the tax. And just send a note. Um, a check is made out to this old town. So the check is made out to this old town, and uh, I'll personally deliver it to your home if you're here in Medfield, or if you want to have it shipped. Um, it brings the cost up to sixteen seventy-five, but I'll mail it to you. We'll have that on the bulletin board because this book, as far as I've listened to you during during our interview, is fascinating. It covers history. It covers stories behind the stories of history. And once that you start to read it, I guarantee you won't let it down. Richard, thank you. Jack, thank you for the for, opportunity. Appreciate for your it. your time. This is Jack Peterson wishing you and yours the very best. And in closing, remember This Old Town by Richard DeSorga. Good night. TV. This program was made possible through the generous support of your Medfield friends and neighbors, folks just like you. And thanks for watching.